trouble with my computer in the last few days. Can you hear me? Yes, I do. That's clear. Very good. And everyone else? Yeah, good. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much to the um, NIHS, NEIS, I should say, in Dutch, and uh, especially to Mrs. Rab and the Frau Rab, who's, I imagine, together with the rest of the team, you're working very, very hard. I can personally say over the last few days, just from the, the messages that uh, she sent me regarding the different clarifications of who and when we'll be giving Shiorim, I think we can really say that she's working day and night. I think at midnight, I had a message from her a couple of nights ago. She's working day and night to get these Shiorim to happen, and I think it's an incredible thing. And I know that I'm coming on to give a Shia really uh, almost two months since the beginning of this program, if I'm not mistaken since we started, uh, the NHS started doing these shiurim. I think it's incredible that every night there's been a shear for people to tune into and listen to even through these times. So, kolakavot to all of you, and we should be able to sit together in, in reality, we should be able to sit together and learn together and study more Torah together. Please God, when all this, this uh, horrible period of our lives goes away. Okay, the truth is that Originally, I discussed with Father Abba about the possibility of speaking about Shavuos, which is probably what everyone wants to be speaking about now. And uh, I was told that quite a few people are speaking about that. So I thought that instead, I would focus on something that's parasha-based, so it's less relevant in the sense of contemporary issues, but it's something, an extremely important message from this week's parasha, that it's so important not to gloss over and to uh, not to gloss over and to get to gain. Hello? Is that really okay? okay? Good. It's so important to, to get the messages of, of this uh, of this uh, parasha in, the, in, in Shavua and to, to work from it and learn something from it. So let's make a start. The beginning of this week's parasha talks about the mitzvah of Shemitah. Shemitah is a very interesting and unusual mitzvah. The Torah says in two places, earlier on in the Torah in Parashas Mishpatim, and also now in Parashas Bahar, the Torah tells us that every seven years, the farmers in Eretz Yisrael, in Israel specifically, must stop farming their fields and must take a break, a sabbatical, a rest break. Sheshanim Tizrasa therefore, for six years, you shall plow the field, for six years, you prune your vineyard, you prune all the fruit of your vineyard, and you do all the regular work and bring in the produce. But in the seventh year, in the seventh year, it's time to stop. It's time to stop working and to give it a break, to rest. Now, what happens in the seventh year? So the farmer doesn't go to the field. He doesn't do all the necessary work that's needed to make produce grow. And in fact, the Torah tells us that he should leave the field open for the poor, for people who don't have food to come and pick from the fruit and eat from the field. And he goes home and he can spend the year doing whatever he wants. The Gemara tells us that the ideal thing, the ideal way he should spend the year is in serving Hashem. He should take the time to study more Torah, to become a better Jew, self-reflection and self-internalization, to become a better person. Now, we're going to go a little bit into this concept of Schmitter, the seventh year. First of all, let's try and understand what exactly is the idea behind this seventh year, this seventh year sabbatical. What was the Torah trying to help us internalize? So amongst the various Roshonim, amongst the various of the early commentators, the medieval commentators, we have a number of different opinions. Let's start with so to speak, the most rational explanation, the Rambam Maimonides in Mona Bochum in the Guide to the Perplexed. So it's well known that the Rambam Maimonides, whenever he generally explains the reasons for the mitzvahs, bear in mind that, let's take a, a, a short aside, when we talk about the reasons for the various mitzvahs, obviously the explanation behind mitzvahs is so deep and so lofty that there couldn't simply just be said that there's only one explanation for any mitzvah. In fact, there's a Gemara that tells us that Shimon Ha'am Sully, the Tanner, Shimon, the, the Tanaic scholar, Shimon Ha'am Sully, used to explain every single one of the mitzvahs. Sorry. 
I, I make a mistake, not Shem Nam Sunni, but that, that, that I don't think it was Shem Nam Sunni, but someone else used to explain every single one of the mitzvahs. Um, and, and, and the Gemara says that, that there were differences of opinion whether you can explain all the mitzvahs or not. But many of the medieval commentators choose to explain the mitzvahs in each way in their own. So the Rambam starts with Mona Bochum and says that the basic understanding of the mitzvah of Shlitta is very simple because it's important from an agricultural perspective to leave the land fallow for a certain amount of time. Fallow meaning in English, I don't know how, I'm not so sure how you would say it in Dutch, but to leave the land fallow means that if the farmer works his field repeatedly year after year after year, eventually the soil loses its nutrients and loses its high quality and slowly the land doesn't produce what it should be producing anymore. It doesn't produce, it's not fertile, it won't re yield the right, the right harvest anymore. So the Rambam says that it's very simple. The Torah tells us that the reason why every seven years we keep the land without working it is so that the land should gain its nutrients back, it should have a rest, and it should recover. Now, technically speaking, the Rambam is of course correct because ultimately the Torah, when it gives us the mitzvahs, when any of the mitzvahs in the Torah are mentioned, there's no specific reason to assume that there can't be benefits, worldly material benefits for the mitzvahs as well. The mitzvahs don't need to be entirely esoteric, entirely lofty and spiritual, where we only understand why we're doing the mitzvahs at, you know, after we pass away from this world and, and, and get to the better world. That, that's not the idea behind the mitzvahs. The mitzvahs can have a material benefit, a physical benefit on this world. But it's important to note that sometimes the explanations that the Raman Mona Bukhan gives, and Raman gives in guide to the text, lack the deeper explanation that the Torah in its own writing, the Torah through its actual text, wants us to appreciate. So many of the commentators point out that here the Torah actually says that the reason for the mitzvah of Shemitah is Shabbos la Hashem. Shabbos la Hashem. Shemitah is a Shabbos. It's a rest day for Hashem. Now, the Torah calls it Shabbos Arex. It's a rest day. It's like the Shabbos. It's a sabbatical of the land. But it's also Shabbos la Hashem. It's a rest day for Hashem. So there's something clearly spiritual about the mitzvah of Shemitah. Now, it's not puzzling that the Rambam would do such a thing, because we know that the Rambam Munavuchim writes the rational, often he writes the rational explanations for the mitzvahs. In fact, the Rambam himself, occasionally, it's an interesting study this, and it's definitely not the exact time and place to go into this in great detail, but the Rambam himself, in the Yad HaChazoka, in his in his 14 volume magnus opus, in his, in his incredible work where he writes down every halacha of the Torah and every law of the Gomorrah in its exact, exact detail. And the Rambam very often contradicts, he contradicts what he says in Moe Nebuchim in the Guide to the Perfects with the explanations he gives to the mitzvahs in the Yad HaChazaka in his book on halacha. And many of the commentators say that it's not a contradiction in the slightest because obviously the Rambam in Guide to the Perfects is saying that the mitzvahs of the Torah can be understood on a very superficial, simple, materialistic level. And if that's enough to inspire a person to become a better Jew, to become more, to, to elevate himself in the service of Hashem, then of course, those explanations are entirely necessary. But the deeper explanations that the Torah wants us to understand are always spiritual and, 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 and often far more complex in, in, their, in their explanation. So let's go on. So there we have Rambam says that the explanation is so that the land should lie fallow. The next explanation is found in Many of the Rishonim, including the Ramban, Nachmanides, who was almost a contemporary of Ramban. And we find it also in the Sefer Achinuch, which is a very interesting book. The Sefer Achinuch was a book written, also a medieval scholar, whose origin, the authorship, is very unknown. Some people say that authorship was someone called the Reb Aram, who was a Talmud of the Rajbal, one of the more well, better known Rishonim of the, the um, common, Gemara commentators of the medieval period. But the Minchas Chinuch, the, the Sefer Chinuch, lists all the mitzvahs. And after every mitzvah, he gives a short paragraph where he says, Mishrosheh HaMitzvah, the roots, the idea behind this mitzvah. And it is a beautiful explanation for each mitzvah and how we can understand it. So the Ramban, Nachmanides, and Chinuch say as follows. They say, well, wait a minute, there's something very simple here about the mitzvah of Shemitah. It's the number six and seven. And six and seven, of course, is extremely Jewish. Shabbos is every seventh day, and Shemitah is every seventh year. So here's a direct connection. In fact, the Torah we just noted, we noted the Torah calls Shemitah the seventh year, the Shemitah, the Shabbos la Hashem, a sabbatical for Hashem, a Shabbos for Hashem. 
says Ramban, the, when Hashem created the world, when God created the world, we know he created it in six days and rested on the seventh. And throughout our lives, we're supposed to remember this magnificent thing that God created the world and internalize it in ourselves. And therefore, whatever we do, we constantly repeat ourselves this, this mantra, this concept that six days Hashem worked, six days Hashem created, and on the seventh day he rested. So there the number six and the number seven constantly play out in our Jewish, in our Jewish, in our religion, they're constantly playing out. So, so the Rambam says that the reason for the mitzvah of Shemitah is ultimately very similar to the reason for the mitzvah of Shabbos, to remind us that the world was created in, seven, in six days and on the seventh day he rested. But whenever, I, whenever I, I hear this explanation of Rambam, I'm always, I'm always stimulated to take this slightly further. The, in, in Judaism, we don't, we don't commemorate events just in terms of the, the memory of the event. For example, as an example, when we celebrate Pesach or, or Shavuos, Shavuos is a celebration of, well, ultimately, according to the Torah of Alper, according to all Torah, Shavuos is a celebration of the giving of the Torah. The Torah was given on the sixth day of Sivan, and um, 49 days after the Jewish people came out of Egypt, and every year we commemorate it. We're not celebrating something that happened in the past because ultimately, as we get further and further away from any event in the past, the event loses, so to speak, some of its, some of its relevance to us because, I mean, you could turn around and say we're three and a half thousand years away from that event. And what if we go to Shabbos itself? When Hashem created the world, when God created the world, He created the world according to Jewish tradition 5,780 years ago. So are we supposed to into every single set, every seven days of the week, we're supposed to sort of just remember it's the world's birthday again. Oh, the world was created in seven days. Great. We're, it's the seventh day again. Seven day. Clearly, there's something more than that. So, a lot, many of the, the commentators, in fact, all the commentators say that there's no such thing as a simple commemoration, just remembering an event from the past. The idea is that we relive events from the past. We're constantly reliving it. We're constantly going through the same motions. So on Pesach every year, on Passover, we're reliving the fact that we came out of Egypt. We're going through it again. We're feeling, as we read in the Haggadah, as we read in the Haggadah on the Seder night, we're saying, A person's obligated to see himself as if he came out of Mitzrayim. And every Shabbos, it's the same thing. Every Shabbos, there's this idea that the world is repeating itself. There's six days of work and there's one day of rest. And the day of rest that Hashem put into the, the world's creation, that Hashem breathed into the world, is something that manifests itself. It repeats itself every seven days of creation. Every seven days of the week, it repeats itself, this concept that the world is resting again. The world is breathing a, a menuchat hanefesh, a, a, a new soul. And in fact, according to, to the Talmud and, 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 and the esoteric, learning of, Jewish, of, of the Jewish teachings, every single Shabbos a person gets in the Shammai Yisera, he gets an extra soul, his soul, he gets, so to speak, another spiritual dimension to himself that he relives Shabbos. So Rav Desler, Rav Eliyar Eliezer Desler, one of the very great um, thinkers of the last, of the last century, who, who lived actually in England for many years, and then he, he moved to Israel and he was a mashkiach in the yeshiva of Pomovit. Rav Desler writes extensively about this, and Rav Desler says that, that Schmitter and Shabbos bring a spiritual rest into the world. What, what does this mean? He says that resting itself, the concept of resting is slightly, it's not physical. We know how we feel when we wake up from a good sleep. There's a certain feeling that, of course, it can be described and explained in physical concept, but it's, it's the sort of expression of, of happiness, of an expression of satisfaction and, and self-desire that comes, it's that kind of expression that, that that's almost a bit spiritual, we could say. It's almost, it, it's something mystical. You know, the, the, the Gemara itself says, the Halach in Shulchan Aruch says, that shame of the Shabbos Kanuk, sleeping on Shabbos, having an afternoon shluk, what, what one of my friends in, in Israel said is called a, 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 um, a, a shnatz, a shenatz arayim, an afternoon sleep, it, it's a tanuk, it's a pleasure, it's enjoyable. It gives us a sort of menuchat nefesh, it gives us an enjoyable sense in our, in our souls. So Rav Dessa says that bringing Shmita and Shabbos is, brings a spiritual element into the physical world. It brings spiritual enjoyment because, of course, our whole lives, we're gearing ourselves up for that moment when we, 
at get to the age of 120 and we, we benefit from the reward of all the toil of our mitzvahs, we benefit from the reward of our mitzvahs, and we get the ultimate spiritual reward that there is in the world to come. That's what our life goal, our life's mission is to get towards. But we can't, get, we can't really get that in this world. We can't really tap into that energy much in this world because this is a material, physical world. We're not able to tap into that. But every seven days, says our Tesla, every seven days and every seven years, we tap into that spiritual enjoyment, that spiritual comfort. We bring down this element of Kedusha, this element of spirituality into our work lives. We stop working and we say, we, we want to appreciate something that's deeper than that, that's more, something, a more refined pleasure. That's what we experience every six, every seven days. That's Shabbos. That's what it is. And, and ultimately, we, we do that with food on the Shabbos and through drinking. But it's something more than that. It's, it's a certain relaxation and a comfort that most people who are outside of the Jewish spectrum, people who are isolated from Jewish thought, would think is a restriction. They'd say, if you can't go to the beach, and if you can't go on your phone, and if you can't do so many of the activities that everyday life includes, then how can you, be, how can you enjoy this? How can you find this, this, a, a, any sense of spiritual satisfaction? But we know as Jews that, in fact, it does contain something that's deeper than that, something more meaningful than that. That's Shabbos. Says Rav Desla, that's Shemitah. That's the concept of this seventh sabbatical year, this seventh year. It's the concept of working for six years, but then seizing from the work, stopping from work, and just enjoying something that's more, that's more meaningful, but deeper. That's how Abdesla explained. In fact, Abdesla says it's very fascinating. He says that there's a Gemara, there's a very famous Talmudic expression, Talmudic passage that says that the, the Shemitah, God forbid, the punishment for not keeping Shemitah, which is also in this week's parasha, this week is a double Sidra. So in the Chokosa, in, in the next section of the Sidra, the Torah describes the punishment, God forbid, for what happens if Jews don't keep the Torah. And the Torah specifically isolates the mitzvah of Shemitah. It says, that the, uh, the Jews will be exiled from their land as a punishment, as a direct divine retribution for not keeping Shemitah. Then the land will rest. In the 70 years, the Gemara tells us that in the 70 years between when the, when the first temple was destroyed and the Jewish people came back from Babel, came back from Babylon to Israel again 70 years later, the Gemara says those 70 years was a direct retribution for 70 times that Shemitah hadn't been kept from the day that the Jews entered the land when they came out of Egypt 40 years. We know that the Jewish people, we can calculate that they were in the land of Israel for about 700 years before the first exile of 70 years to Babel. And in those 700 years, they apparently failed to keep Shemitah in proper entirety, in the full halachic sense. They just didn't keep Shemitah as they should have kept 70 times. And those 70 years that they didn't keep Shemitah, the Torah warns the Torah promises, unfortunately, God forbid, in, next, in this week's parasha, in Bukha Koyisai, that Oz Tirtzeha Oret says Shabbos Yisera. Then the land will rest. It'll rest. It'll, it'll finally get the much needed rest that you failed to give the land all those years. And Rav Desta says that's fascinating because clearly, seemingly, the failure to keep Shemitah brings terrible punishment. Yet the Gomorrah in another place says that the reason why the Jews were exiled after the destruction of the first temple was because of a completely different reason. The people were exiled after the destruction of the first temple for the simple reason that they did the Shor Shaberis Chamoros, the three cardinal sins, the three most, most terrible sins, idolatry, adultery, and, and murder. So Rav Desla asks, how is it possible? How can it be that on one hand the Gomorrah tells us that it's for the three cardinal sins, and on the other hand it seems to be something connected to not keeping Schmitter properly? I mean, is Schmitter all that bad? So Tesla explains, based on something we just said until now, he says that the idea of Schmitter is to bring spirituality down into the material world. When we work and when we get on with our lives, we're constantly, we're constantly distracted from spirituality. We're distracted from tapping into who we are. And Schmitter reminds us, it's a way of reminding the farmer, it's a way of reminding everyone that, in fact, there's a spiritual essence, there's a spiritual dimension to living through this world. So Abdessa says, if a person fails to tap into that spiritual dimension, then obviously it's going to lead to a complete deterioration, a complete downfall in his spiritual level. And those three cardinal sins at the Gomorrah list are just a, they're just a direct option. They're a direct side effect of a person who fails to bring spirituality down into his life. That's how Abdesla connects those two Gemara. It's very fascinating. But now let's move on. 
because the Kliyokal, who's one of the, the later commentators on the Torah, says, takes this idea and says something extremely fundamental about Shmita and so relevant to us today. He says that the essence of Shmita is very simple. A person works, he toils, he's constantly working and, like we said a minute ago, distracted from spirituality. He's involved with earning a livelihood. And as time goes by, there's always a risk that a person could be successful. And that's fantastic. But success brings a person to sometimes forget the, the cause, the, 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 the real true source of all his success. And he starts to think, the Torah says, Things, it, it's just the strength of my hand. It's all my own handiwork that did all this to me. It, I, I'm an incredible person. The reason why my field is, is working so well and the reason why I'm earning so much money is because I, I, I developed the farm right and I, I planted at the right times and I did everything I should have done and I studied horticulture, horticulture and agriculture as I should have. And, and the money that I'm now making, the, the, the material wealth that I'm now amassing, that I'm now gathering, is just a direct result of, of, that, of, of, this, of, of, of this hard work that I've put in. And more than that is that a person, as he's engrossed in his day-to-day -day activities, he just thinks, he sees the, the crop growing from the ground. He plants the seed and he sees crop growing and he thinks, Oilon come in the world just, the world just happens, things just happen, there's such a thing as nature. And, and everything happens as it should. You plant a seed and, 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 and the wheat grows out in the field. That's it. It's very simple. There is nothing more. There's no spiritual dimension. There's just a world with laws and patterns. And we can manipulate those patterns. If you plant at the right time, then the crop grows. The world just gets on. So Hashem says, every six years, I want them to stop. I want them to stop and do something completely and utterly ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Leave your field alone. Now, the ridiculous thing isn't just, there's two elements of, of why this is ridiculous. It's ridiculous because in the seventh year, he's not planting his field. But it's equally ridiculous because what's he himself going to eat in the seventh year? In other words, the Torah says, starve yourself in the seventh year. You don't need to have anything to eat. Don't plant and don't eat. Remember that we're talking about, we're talking especially when the Torah describes the of Shemitah, in, 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 the, time, in, in the time of the, 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 the first temple, of course, we're talking about a time when there, there was no banks, and no loans, there's no sort of government scheme like we know today, like government schemes whereby a person could just take off work and, and the government will, will, will fork out the money to, to make sure that he can supply himself. There's no unemployment benefit. So the Torah tells him, take a year off. And he asks the question. The, the Torah describes the question a person himself might ask. He might say, you will say, what will we eat? What are we going to eat in the year that we don't plant anything? So Hashem says, Mitsivisi Esburkosi, I'll command my blessing, Bashom Hashishis. In the sixth year, you're going to see something spectacular. You're going to see that the land in the sixth year will produce not just one crop, not two amounts, but three amounts. The land will produce enough for the sixth year, the seventh year, and the sixth year, the seventh year, and the beginning of the eighth year. Because remember that in the eighth year, when the farmer comes back to his field and begins to plant, He's not going to be able to harvest his plantation for a while still. So the Torah promises him three years worth of crop. Now, just as an aside, I'm always, I'm always blown by this promise of the Torah because if anyone, if anyone had any doubts ever that the, the, the Torah wasn't divine, then the mitzvah of Shemitah is, is just a direct proof that the Torah was written not by human, not by human, uh, by human hands, but by Hashem. Because how could any human being ever promise how can any, any ever assure anyone that in the sixth year there will be a crop that will last for three years? It's an incredible promise that the Torah gives. So the Kriyoka says, what's the message here? The Torah is trying to tell the farmer something. The Torah is trying to show him that, in fact, you should know that things aren't in your control. It may look like it's your control. For six years you plan and you do what you can. But ultimately, everything's going to come from Hashem. Everything that's meant to come your way will come your way. All material wealth, any material wealth, it's all from Hashem. That's the reality. And, and in the seventh year, the farmer sits down and he, he thinks about this and he internalizes it. He internalizes the last six years were good. I planted the field and things, things turned out the way I hoped them to turn out. But ultimately, I could never have ensured that the sixth year will provide me a crop like it did. I could never have done that. 
That comes from Hashem. And it's so to speak a reminder that it's a, a way to pause and to stop and to say, when we work, it's not all, our material wealth that we make. It's, it's not from us. It's not really from us. It, it's all from Hashem. That's where it comes from. And, and this idea, there's, there's so much to work with this idea. So, so, where, so, so much we can take this to. But I, I saw a beautiful idea recently written on, the, on a very similar subject that, that, that needs a bit, of, a, little, a bit of background. When the Torah introduces the mitzvah, we're going to take this aside for a moment. When the Torah introduces the mitzvah of Shemitah, the Torah starts off the very first pasuk, the first sentence of this week's parasha. And it says, Hashem, Moshe, the Har Sinai Lemo. Hashem spoke to Moshe on Mount Sinai saying, Hashem spoke to Moshe on Har Sinai, and he said as follows, Davel Bnei Israel, speak to the people of Israel and tell them about the mitzvah of Shemitah. So Rashi, the medieval commentator, asks, why does the Torah start off with this, the Har Sinai? Hashem spoke to Moshe on Har Sinai. Bear in mind that we're now in Parshas Bahar. Bahar is many weeks from Yisroi, from the, the week in which we read that the Torah was given. And to all intent and purpose, the Torah is probably, I imagine, and I'm not an account, I imagine that most of the mitzvahs in the Torah, or at least a good percent of the mitzvahs in the Torah, have been already said, spoken out between Yisroi, between the giving of the Torah and this week's Sedra. So many of the mitzvahs of the Torah have been mentioned. And in not one of those mitzvahs, in none of them, does the Torah say, the Har Sinai, on Mount Sinai. Hashem told this mitzvah on Har Sinai. Ask Rashi, so why did the Torah do that? Why does the Torah emphasize that this mitzvah was given on Har Sinai? So Rashi says something fascinating. He says it's teaching us a lesson. Just like all the mitzvah, just like this mitzvah was said on Har Sinai, not just in its simplest sort of statement, but in its most complicated, in all its explanation, and I'll explain this in a minute, I'll, take, I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on that in a second, so too, all the mitzvahs were said at Sinai. What does Rashi mean? Rashi means as follows. We mentioned earlier that the Torah says the mitzvah of Shemitah two places. Number one is in Mishpatim. That's the Sedra immediately following the giving of the Torah. The Torah mentions very briefly that there's a mitzvah to rest the field on the seventh year. Now, the Torah doesn't give much detail there. Now, in 12 or 13 parishes later, 12 or 13 portions per later, the Torah mentions that in fact, this is how you observe the mitzvah of Shemitah. This is all the various, this is the various uh, um, details of the mitzvah, etc. So Rashi says, it's very simple. The Torah is trying to show us that don't think that only what was written previously in Parashat Mishpatim, that's what was said at Sinai. But now, what the explanation, the sort of detail, you might say, the, the you know, what people think is the, the halachic discussion that takes place in the, in the Bet Midrash, that wasn't given at Sinai. No, says Rashi, everything was given at Sinai. All of it was given at Sinai, all the explanations. Maimonides Rambam writes at the beginning of this Yad HaChazaka that we mentioned before, the beginning of his work on Halacha, he writes that the entire Torah, it's a fundamental element of Jewish belief, that the entire Torah, including the mitzvahs that are written, the actual words of the text of the, of the five books of Moshe, and all explanations, even the explanations that aren't actually written, with what we call the Torah Shabal Peh, the oral law, everything was given at Har Sinai, everything was given on Mount Sinai. So Rashi is telling us it's very simple. The Torah is emphasizing that this mitzvah, including its detail that's mentioned in this week's parasha, were all given at Sinai. That's what the Torah is trying to say. And everyone asks that Rashi's he, he's left out something major because very nice, fantastic. So all the mitzvahs of the Torah were given at Har Sinai, and all the explanation was given at Har Sinai. But one second, why did the Torah choose this mitzvah to be the one to show that point? The Torah could have taken any mitzvah and said. This mitzvah was said at Har Sinai, and here's the detail. And we would have learned that, every, that this mitzvah and all other mitzvahs are said at Sinai in all their detail, not just in a very vague sort of description, but all the detail of mitzvahs are said at Sinai. And I could have thought of much better mitzvahs to do. We could have used the mitzvah of Pesach or something. Pesach, you know, the Jews came out of Egypt, there was 10 plagues. It's incredible, it's fantastic, and it's so, so um, um, uh, mind-boggling. And you know, this mitzvah, with all its detail, was said at Sinai. The Torah elaborated at Sinai. And instead, the Torah just says, oh, Shmita, the mitzvah of Shmita, to keep the land fallow, that was said at Sinai. And you know what? It's not just the mitzvah of Shmita that was said at Sinai, it's all mitzvahs that were said at Sinai, with all their explanation. So why is it the mitzvah of Shmita? I saw an incredible idea. What did we just say before? We said, what's the essence of the mitzvah of Shemitah? What's the lesson? What's the message? 
The lesson of the Mitzvah of Shmita is that Sivisias Perchosi. Now Hashem says, on the sixth day, I'm going to show you that I am the God of nature. I'm going to show you that I'm behind nature. I'm going to show you that everything comes from me, that no matter how much you work and no matter how much you invest, ultimately I'm the giver, I'm the decider of how much a person, how much a person has. And we mentioned that for 1,000, for 1,400 years, the Jews were in the land of, of, of Eretz before they were exiled at the, after the Second Temple. 1,400 years they were keeping Shmita. We mentioned that 70 of them weren't kept in their entirety and properly. And according to the Gemara, that simply means that not the, the entire nation didn't keep Shmita properly. But for 1400 years, Shmita was kept. That's 200 Shmitas. I've done the maths. It's 1400 divided by seven. That's 200 or so Shmitas. It's slightly more complicated because there's a, an opinion in the Gemara that says, in fact, that Shmita is every 49 years and not every 50 years. So, um, so, so there could be more than that in, in 1400 years. But but, um, but ultimately, it's 1,400 years that Schmidt is kept. And in all those years, we're not talking about, again, a time of banks and loans and, and unemployment schemes. And every single time, the people lived through this experience, they lived through this lesson of the Tzivisi Esperachosi, I'll command my blessing. I, Hashem, am the God of nature. I will command my blessing and show you that it's from me. It's all from me. And you know, it's, it, it's incredible because it's not just, it, 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 we th the Mitzvah of Shmita today is, 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 is fascinating to study in, in greater detail because according to many opinions, the Rambam included, the Mitzvah of Shmita today isn't a Torah obligation anymore. Now that we don't have a Beit HaMikdash, the Mitzvah of Shmita today is rabbinic, but in fact, we still see that all, many Orthodox farmers, many religious farmers on, 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 on the land of Israel in their saw keep Shmita and attempt to keep Shmita to the best of their abilities. But today as well, we, we hear stories, it, it's, it's not often because it's every seven years, but there's incredible stories of, of miraculous and divine, divine providence that happens when people keep Schmitta. It's not just things that the Torah promises that are in a sort of an era, a long bygone era that we can't relate to anymore, a, a time when people lived in close proximity to spirituality and divine things. In, in, in our own day, I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's, a, there's, a, there's an organization that publishes stories, farmers' testimonies. Every seven years after the year of Schmitta, there's an organization in Israel that publishes testimonies of farmers' own um, 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 experiences with this incredible divine bracha, this divine blessing of the Tzavisius Berchossi, of, of seeing divine, divine guidance and divine help, even though they kept the lambs fallow for, for a whole year, which is an incredibly seemingly ridiculous thing to do in today's secular society. Just, just as, a, as an example of one story, there's a very well-known Moshav in Israel called Moshav Kormimiyot. Kormimiyot. And this Moshav Kormimiyot was set up many years ago. It's one of the oldest religious Moshavs in the country. And if I'm not mistaken, it was 1952. The year of 1952 was a Schmitter year. It was just after the state was formed. And of course, there was so little money in the state and poverty. And, and, and people at that time were investing all their money and all their energy into farming, 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 getting the land going and draining the swamps and cultivating the land so it could become a place for so many Jews to live in. And Moshav Primamios had their own areas of land that they lived off when they, by selling the produce, etc. And in this Moshav, they decided that they were going to keep Shmita in its entirety. They were going to study the laws of Shmita and keep Shmita. Of course, many of the people around them sadly thought they were you know, crazy. This is, it's ridiculous. It's, there's absolutely no, no, there's no, there's no logic in, in, in leaving your land fallow for a year whilst, whilst uh, people live in such abject poverty. And what's incredible is that, uh, that they, they say that, that that year, that 1952 was Schmidt, and in the following, in, at the end, towards the end of the year, around the end, if I'm not mistaken, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a farmer, but if I'm not mistaken, around the end of the year, the, the farmers start planting the, the wheat crop, the, the next year's, the next season's wheat produce. And in that year, there was such poverty that they couldn't afford to buy wheat from, to buy wheat kernels from surrounding fields, from surrounding uh, farmers. And they looked through their storehouses and they found very little to use. And they only found some, one silo that was full of, of, of broken, wormy kernels, kernels that had literally gone moldy. That, I'm, I'm led to believe don't, there's absolutely very little chance, no chance whatsoever of these kernels being used to, to uh, these kernels being used to, um, to, to that, for anything to grow from them. But there was absolutely nothing they could do. So they, they planted these kernels. They, they, they said, we're going to plant these kernels come what may, and there's nothing, we have no other option. There's nothing better for us to do. 
Then it came the Yontav of Sukkot. Now Sukkot is at the end, the, the Shemitah year begins Rosh Hashanah, begins at Rosh Hashanah, ends Rosh Hashanah. So immediately after Rosh Hashanah, they wanted to begin planting, but it was Sukkot. And there's a halacha that says that a person can't plant the fields, nothing to do with Shemitah, but on Cholomoyed, on the intermediary days, the intermediary days of Sukkot, or, or, or Pesach as well, a person can't plant the fields. So they wanted to plant, but it was Cholomoyed. So they went to the leader, the, one of the greatest minds of uh, halachic minds of, the, of that time, the Chazanish, of the Rav Shaya Karelitz, and they, they begged him to find them a solution so that they could plant their broken kernels of wheat that year in, during the Cholomoyed Sukkot, during the intermediary days. And the Chazanish turned to them and said, but why? Why do you want to plant now? Why don't you just wait a week and plant in a week? And they said to him, because we're worried that the rain will already come, and when the rain comes, we need that the produce should be in the ground. So the Chazanish said to them, but why do you think the rain's going to come early this year? Maybe the rain's going to be late. And if you plant now, then the seeds will be in the ground for too long, and they'll ruin in the ground, and they won't sprout, they won't fertilize. So why, don't you, why are you worried that the rains will come early? You should be worried the rains will come late. I advise you not to plant. And we can, we don't, we've spent a whole year trusting in Hashem. Let's not let yourself down now. Let's keep going. I'm going to see miracles. And they listened to the Chazanish's advice, and they planted. And that year, the rains came late. And many of the surrounding fields were planted earlier on in the year. Their crop had got ruined in, in the ground. The seeds were ruined in the ground before the rains came. But that year, the rains came late. And th their miracles continued five years later. A, um, a, big, a big developer came into that area of land, and, and, and these stories, I say, are documented stories. Five years later, a developer came to the land and he wanted to plant multiple vineyards across that entire section of Israel. And he offered a deal to Moshe Matzial that he'll plant for them a vineyard, but they have to invest money in him. There's a serious investment of money. I don't know how many millions of, of shekel is of an investment one would have to invest. And, um, and the, 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 the farmers of Moshe Kuyumir said to him, we're willing to invest and plant. But the condition is that our vineyard doesn't get worked on during the year of Schmidt, which is two years from now. And the developer said, it's ridiculous. You're ridiculous. A vineyard gets ruined. You have to, plant, you have to work on it in two years from now, especially so early on in its, in its, in its growth, in its life. And they said, no, we're only willing to invest if, if this is the deal. So they agreed, but they said, but the, the developer said, it's on your head. It's, this is your responsibility. It's not our problem if you lose. And two years later, again, they kept their fields empty. They, they, they left their fields and they, they, they stopped the seeds from working. They didn't do any work. And indeed, that year as well, they produced a fantastic crop, natural, a natural crop of, 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 of wine, of, of grapes that came off their fields that year. Now, it's, it's, how do we get to, how do we, what's the idea? The Spinker Rebbe, one of the great Hasidic minds of pre-war Europe, said that the Torah is trying to show us, back to our question, we asked before, why does the Torah use specifically this mitzvah, specifically the mitzvah of Shemitah, to tell us that all the mitzvahs and all the explanation came from Sinai. So the Spinker ever says it's very simple. Because the reward for keeping the mitzvahs is that we live a life that's completely above nature, completely above laws. It's not just Shmitta. Shmitta is just the example. Through Shmitta, through the Shmitta, the observance of Shmitta, and through the Torah's incredible promise, that Sivisias Burkosi, that in the sixth year, there's going to be extra crop. Through that incredible promise, we see, we, 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 we witness to the fact that the Torah, the reward for keeping the Torah is above nature. The reward for doing the Rotsman of Hashem, doing the, the will of Hashem, doing the will of God, is above nature. And it reveals everything. It reveals that all the things, it's like as if it's just a, it's just a marshal, it's just a parable. Not just Shmita is at Har Sinai. Not just the midst of Shmita was given over Har Sinai. In other words, not just the assurance that doing the mitzvahs will result in an unnatural reward comes from Sinai, but all the mitzvahs that are written at Sinai, or the observance of every one of those mitzvahs at Sinai, that brings an unnatural reward to a person. That brings, in this world, not just in the next world, but in this world, unnatural benefits. It, 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 when, I, when I heard this, I, when I saw this idea this week, I, I thought to myself that, it's incredible that we're living through a time when in some way or other we could we could describe this as our own schmitter for many of us there's, there's a certain element of schmitter many of us for a while now haven't been able to work people haven't been able to go out and earn money in the way that they used to and for a lot of people their their livelihood their source of income is threatened and in danger and we're forced to sit at home this is this is exactly what schmitter is it's exactly what what Shmita is, there's, there's an insecurity about where our money comes from. We've only got time to sit in our houses and study Torah. 
Isn't this then the best time to internalize the message of Shmita that keeping the Torah and doing what God wants, it brings an unnatural reward. It brings something that, that's not natural. And when we face, we don't know how many months, countless months, or even God forbid, years of economic recession, it's this idea that, that, can, bring us, that can bring us through and, and, and help us guide us through these times that the reward for keeping the Torah is not natural. We do our efforts, but the reward for keeping, for doing what God wants isn't natural. It doesn't matter if we're unable to go and work. It doesn't matter. The reward is unnatural. And I, I've seen this, I've seen this incredible word on um, um, reward. One, one witnesses this in, in, in so many different ways. This unnatural, this week I, I heard a story. I have to share it. It's, it's a story that has nothing to do with Schlitter, but it's someone I know well who lives in England. And this, this story, is, is an incredible, incredible story happened this week. I, um, a friend of ours, a family friend, saw me know, he has a, a nine-year-old child and, and, uh, and, and his child for a few days, this is very recent, last week, this week, his child for a few days was sick with headaches and temperatures and, and, and the, the, doctor, the doctor said he assumes it's nothing, it'll pass and the child kept complaining he had a, a severe headache and eventually the mother, the parents went back to the doctor and they said that we're very nervous about our child and, and we really like to get him assessed. And, and the doctor said that, um, the doctor said, okay, you know, mother's instinct, you should, you should take him in, you should take him into hospital. So in, in, in England, like in Holland, at the moment, only one parent can go into hospital with, with a child, ever there's a situation where someone needs to be hospitalized. So the father went into hospital, my, my friend and his wife stayed at home. And um, he goes to hospital and they take the rush the kid in and run him, run him through some tests. And the doctor gives him uh, MRI scans or CAT scans or something. And, and the, the doctor turns to him and he says, when the, when the, test, when the results of the test come through, and he says, I'm, I've got some really sad news to tell you that your son has a, a significantly big brain tumor in, on the side of his head. And we need to operate with, on him within the next few hours. It's, it's a matter of life and death. We need to operate within the next few hours. And of course, the, the doctor sits there and tells this shocked father that the, the, the procedure and the dangers of the procedure and the recovery period afterwards and, 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 and the challenges that will be along the way and, and the father's completely, he's, 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 he's shocked and he's in hysterics and he didn't know what to do and, and he, he doesn't want to phone his wife who's at home and tell her and he doesn't know how to explain it to her and he calls a family friend and asks if he can go around to the house and try and let his wife in, to, in on the fact that, you know, the, the terrible sad news that they just got And in the meantime, they rush the child into surgery. And this was this week, they rush the child into surgery. And in the meantime, his wife came to the hospital to join him and she wasn't allowed to enter the hospital. So they're sitting outside the hospital waiting, sitting in the the, the entrance to the hospital waiting to, 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 to hear how the, the surgery's gone, davening and praying and praying and saying to Hillel and the Psalms and, 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 and crying and, and to messages went round in the communities in England to daven this child. And after a few hours or so, the, the, the surgeon comes out the door and he's looking for them. And he says, um, are you the parents of this Miss Chad? And they say, yeah. And he says, I've got some, what you might call relatively good news to tell you that we've operated on your son and we've opened up his, his skull and we can see that in fact, he doesn't have a brain tumor. He has a huge clot, a blood clot on his brain. And we've removed the whole clot. And um, I don't know the medical, uh, medical procedure or the after effects, but he says, but, but it's significantly um, um, less dangerous or better off than, than if he had, God forbid, had, had a, a brain tumor. And the parents are absolutely, the parent, my friend, he was absolutely shocked. He, he was in shock and he's sitting there and he can't believe it. You know, he's, a few hours ago, he was told that his son has a, a massive brain tumor. And, and, uh, and, and now he's told it's a blood clot, but, but the story goes further. About five minutes later, and this, this my, my friend, this happened this week, like I said, five minutes later, the doctor who originally did the scans comes out looking for them. And he says, I'd like to, to carry on discussing with you. Now, now that the child's, in, now that your son's in surgery, I'd like to talk to you about the next stages and the, the, after, the follow-up treatment and radiotherapy and chemotherapy, whatever, whatever therapies they, they have to give. And the father's shocked. The father was shocked, and he said, "I don't understand it. My child doesn't have a brain tumor." And the doctor looks at him sadly and says, "I'm sorry to tell you, your child has a brain tumor." He says, "My child doesn't have a brain tumor." He says, the, the doctor, I imagine, thought that this this man had gone out of his mind in, in, in his in his in his uh, in his anxiety and despair. He'd gone out of his mind, and he did. He, 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 the father's imagining that it's not it's not as bad as it is. That he doesn't have a brain tumor, but he does have a brain tumor. And, and the father, he got hysterical and he said he doesn't, and the surgeon just came out and he told me he doesn't have it. Eventually the doctor agreed to go and ask the surgeon what's going on. The doctor hadn't been updated by the surgeon that it wasn't a brain tumor, but it was a blood clot. 
And when the doctor was told that it wasn't a brain tumor, it was a blood clot, the doctor was shocked and he was white and called the parents into the room and he said, this on the screen, in my knowledge, in all my medical expertise, is a brain tumor, not a blood clot. That's what this on the screen is. But somehow or other, you have, you, we're witnessing a miracle, he said. We're witnessing a miracle. Because when the doctors opened up your child, they saw that it's a blood clot. And I've never made that mistake before, he says. But apparently miracles do happen. This happened, I was, this, happened this week, like I said. Miracles do happen. And when we, when we do the, what Hashem wants, and we do witness a, a, level of, of, of an, a level of life, a level of existence that's above nature, that's above, it's, a, it, it, it's above nature. Of course, we have to remember that when we toil something, when we work hard, it's obvious to remember that we have to do our shtablut, we have to do our efforts, we always have to do what's, what's, incum what's incumbent upon us to do. You know, the Masilis Yishorim, the, the Masilis Yishorim is, is, is an incredible work of Jewish faith and, and, and Jewish Muslim, Jewish ethics that was written by Ramosh Chaim Sato, who lived here in Amsterdam about 300 years ago. He says that an incredible thing, he says, Lo hu hamoyl, ela shahu Hishtablos, our efforts that we invest into doing things, they're not the things that make anything work. That's not what activates it. It's just mukhrach, it's necessary. We live in a world of nature. We live in a world where, for some reason or other, we, there's various explanations, but for some reason or other, Hashem chose that we have to work. We have to, by the sweat of your brow, you'll eat bread. We have to invest our physical energies into things if we want to reap the reward. But ultimately, it's not what activates anything. Losha ishtablut for hamoyo. The ishtablut isn't what does anything. It's mochra. It's just necessary. Rav Nachman of Breslov said a beautiful parable to explain this. He said, imagine a traveler who's walking from town to town and he's weary and tired and hungry. He needs, he needs food. And someone tells him that there's a house down the road where, um, where he'll find good food and inn where they'll feed him and, and look after him for the night. So he goes down the road and he sees two doors, two houses, one next to the other. And he's not sure which one is the right house. So he takes his I guess he takes his chance and he knocks on the door. And uh, unfortunately, it's the wrong person. The person who lives in this house isn't a generous man whatsoever. He's a big miser. So he says, is there any food here? And the miser says, well, come in and we'll see. So he goes into the house and, um, and he says, uh, come, I'm, I'm tired and weary from the journey. I'd like some food. So the miser says, okay, no problem, but you have to work for your food. You have to do a few hours of work. So he sets them about the house cleaning and sweeping up and toiling and doing all sorts of activities. And after several hours, the miser turns to him with sort of a, a smirk, a smirk on his face. And he says, right, if you want your supper, if you want your dinner, you can knock on the house next door. So he goes out the house, knocks on the house next door, and the man greets him and he says, I've, I've come here for my supper. And the man says, of course, with pleasure, come in. He sits him down, he gives him a meal, fit for royalty, gives him a, a fantastic meal. And in the meal, the, the traveler turns to his, his host and he says, you know, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to you that you gave me such a lovely meal, but why did I have to work for so many hours for this? So the host says, what, you have to work? So, yeah, to work in, 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 in the house next door. So he says, well, I'm sorry, but you've been tricked because you had to work because you wouldn't have found the right door otherwise. But your work did nothing because you could have got the food without you because the food comes to you not as a direct reward for the work, but simply because I'm here and I'm generous and I'm happy to give you the food. In other words, if we have, and Ramachman explains, if we hadn't done the work, we wouldn't have been guided to the right avenues of our, of our, of our success. We wouldn't have been guided down the right path to, to take. So we have to invest our efforts, but the efforts are just, they're just that, they're just efforts. And ultimately, all the reward comes from, um, so all the reward comes from Hashem. Shvita is also a time that the farmer appreciates this. It's a time the farmer appreciates that everything comes from Hashem. And in fact, he doesn't just appreciate it, but he gives to others. What does the farmer do? He opens up his field for the poor. He gives to others during the year of Shemitah. He realizes the necessity that others have. And when he sees what others lack and what others need, he realizes that he also lacks. A person, when he realizes not to take, when he sees what other people suffer, he realizes not to take things for granted. And unfortunately, today, we're also seeing that somewhat. We see people suffering with their health, and we realize that we shouldn't really take these things for granted whatsoever. We shouldn't take our material success for granted. We shouldn't take our, our health for granted. The fact that our lungs are, are breathing every, every breath of oxygen that goes into our lungs, the fact that our hearts continue to beat, these are things that we should never take for granted. They're incredible things that happen from the moment we're born and we hope until, until at the age of 120. And these are things we shouldn't take for granted. And, and finally, the Schmitter, what does the farmer do during Schmitter? We'll end off with one more idea. What does the farmer do? He said that the farmer spends Schmitter 
davening and learning, focusing on Torah, spending his time, investing his energies in, in, in the learning that he didn't have the time so much to do. He didn't have time to do while he was busy working because we don't always get that time while we're working to invest in the spiritual side of our lives. I saw an incredible idea that really, if, if someone were to, to, to offer someone, I'll, I'll offer you, I'll offer any one of you, that you can sit at home and have all your food brought for you, have no worries, nothing to fear, all you need to, you can lie in bed all day, but for the, for the next five years, are you interested? None, no problem with, with food, food will be brought to you, three meals a day, brought to your bedroom door. So most people, especially teenagers, might say, oh great, fantastic, yeah? But imagine someone's, why, but someone asks the following question, why is that any different to a prison? What happens in a prison, the inmate, the, the, the patient, the, the, the cellmate, sorry, he lies on his bed and food's brought to him three times a day and he doesn't have to do anything, nothing in the world. So why is prison in so many different cultures, all over the world, prison's always been this punishment system, a disciplinary system. Why? It's, it, it's great. The answer is very simple because no one wants to be locked up against their will. No one minds sitting at home if it's not against their will, if they can choose to leave the house again, but no one likes to be locked up against their will. And the moment we find ourselves in a time where we're locked up and somewhat against our will, and it, 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 it tremendously bothers us, we feel claustrophobic with this lockdown. Thank God now the lockdown is opening in so many countries, but it makes us feel claustrophobic. And yet, we find something fascinating. The Kohen Godel, the high priest in the Rishamik, the Torah says there's a specific mitzvah that he lives at home, he lives in a Bet Mikdash, sorry, and he doesn't leave the Bet Mikdash Almost at all. He can leave at night to go home, but he should make sure to live near the Bet Dash. That's where he lives. And the Rambam, my mom, these writes that it's Tiharatu, it's a glory, it's, a, it's an incredible, it's the praise of the Kohen Gold that he stays his whole time in the Bet Dash. Why does the Rambam call it a praise? Because of exactly what we just said. It's an incredible thing to be able to be isolated at home, to be isolated in the Bet Dash or in one spot and not feel frustrated and not feel restricted or claustrophobic. So, how did the Kohen Gold do it? What was the secret to the Kohen Gadol's ability to stay hemmed in, to stay in four walls and not feel frustrated, not feel the need to, to break out? So Rav Shimshon Pinkas, one of the thinkers of the last uh, half a century in Israel, writes that there's a fascinating Agada Gomorrah that says that Odom Arishon, the first man, Odom, in, 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 in Pashas Gracious, there's a Gomorrah that says that he had, whatever the Gomorrah means, whether we can take it literally or not take it, or it's a message, the Gomorrah says that Odom Arishon was the height, the height of the first man was the height of the ground till the sky. That's how tall he was. And his, his width was from one end of the world to the other. That, that's how, he was incredibly big, so to speak. And we don't know if this is literal or, or it definitely, whatever, whatever the explanation, there's something for us to understand from this Gomorrah. So Pinker says, and what does it mean he was so tall, he was so wide? It means that, and then, sorry, and then after he sit, the, then the Gomorrah carries on the glasses, when he sinned and he ate from the tree, then his size was cut down. So Rapinka says, what does it mean his size was cut down? It means that he was, he was shrunk. So he was put from being this incredibly massively dimensional being who's so tall and so wide, put into the size that we human beings are. So Rapinka says, it's, the, the message of this Gomorrah is profound. A person has the ambition to expound, to expand. We always want to break free. We want to be loose. We want to try, try, go cross all boundaries. We, we'd like to explore the world. We'd like to go on holiday to the furthest place of the world. We'd like to know the news and know the information from everywhere around the world. We want to be everywhere. We want to not just be in one location. We want to be everywhere at the same time. We'd like to sort of control the whole world in, from our, four, our little walls with our little internet. We, we want to be everywhere. We want to know about everything. And that's a human ambition. That ambition, says Rapinkas, comes from the incredible size that Adam had. Adam had this size that was the entire globe was sort of under his control. And when it was minimized, when he was shrunk, and he, he felt that he had been, um, um, so to speak, um, restrained, so to speak, forced into a small little box. But really, he wanted to be bigger than that. He wanted to be everywhere. And all human beings bear, we all share the same ambition to be bigger than that, to be bigger. So Adam Rishon wants to be so big. So uh, human beings want to be so big. Says Rav Pinkus, why does the Gemara note that there's two sizes? He was as wide as the whole world, but he was as tall as from the ground to the sky. What's the Gemara trying to demonstrate? He says that really it's the same thing. A person has an ambition to be big. 
He has an ambition to be wide, to be everywhere, to see everything, to know everything. But that ambition can go in two ways. It can go lengthways, or it can go from bottom to top. It can go upways. It can go across the globe, across the earth, or it can grow from, go from the point that a person standing in upwards to the heaven. And Adam had both of those abilities. He had the ability to be wet width ways or, or from top to bottom, going up, up in the world. So he says a person can, can use, a person can utilize this ambition to, to be everywhere and to know everything in one of two ways. He can either want to know and be everywhere in the material world. He can want to be all over, all over planet Earth and explore everywhere and be let out and go on holidays to the most exotic locations of the Caribbean and then to Thailand and then to follow the news of everything that's happening in China and Japan and everywhere around the world. That's one way a person can express this desire to be everywhere. But another way a person can express this desire to be everywhere is by standing exactly where he is and looking upwards and growing upwards and expanding upwards. And that's a spiritual growth. A person can stand in one spot and can connect all the way through sort of the physical, the physical world, so to speak, all the way up, up, up. Like Adam was as tall as the sky. He can be up. He can be as high as the sky. He can go from one spot on earth. He can stay in one little place and be all the way. His, his spiritual levels can, can boost, can bounce like a firework. They can rock it all the way up to the heavens. So Apinkas explains that the coin Godel, the high priest, he wasn't hemmed into the Bet Mikdash. Because he didn't feel restrained in any way. He didn't feel like he was imprisoned by the fact that he had to stay in the bed of the the whole time. He felt free because from his little spot on earth, he, all he was doing was focusing on the divine, focusing on things so much greater, so much bigger than us, that was so high up and so lofty, that he was able to stand in one spot and feel and experience that desire to be bigger, to be bigger than our little four, three dimensions and our little human bodies on this planet. And that's ultimately what, we can, what Schmidt is all about. Schmidt is the ability for the farmer to sit in one spot and, 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 and cross all those boundaries of, of claustrophobia and feeling he wants to be out by studying Torah, by, by studying Torah, by sitting and focusing for that year on divine, on focusing on self-improvement, on, on special things. And it's, in that sense, it's so relevant for us today. It's so relevant for us at the moment because for the last couple of months, and who knows, Please God not, but perhaps for a bit longer, we'll be still slightly hemmed in and, 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 and restrained in, in one way or another in a physical sense. But it doesn't need to make us feel, if we don't have a summer holidays this August, it doesn't need to make us feel claustrophobic because we can experience that incredible desire that human beings have to grow by focusing on the divine, by reaching up, by within our little houses, by exactly what we're doing now. Not one of us has come out to anywhere. We're all in our houses or wherever we are behind a screen, but we're able to reach up, 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 to grow, to explore, to learn more, to study more together. That's the essence of Shmita, and that's the, such an incredible lesson, as we said. Shmita teaches us that everything comes from Hashem, that nothing's nature, there is no nature, there's just our efforts, but ultimately Hashem, the Tzvises Bukhasi, Hashem commands his blessing as he wants to, when he wants to, as he sees fit. And of course, when we feel that we're not at work, when we feel worried about our panos, when we feel worried about all these things, we remember that point. And we remember that ultimately, this is an opportunity to connect, to grow bigger and connect to the divine, connect to something bigger and become better people. That when we, we do go back out there, when we do explore the world, and we, we do see all the things we'd like to see, we're already improved people, we're better people. I, I, I appreciate everyone who tuned in to listen. And again, thanks to the NIS and, and, and the Farab and all the staff for making these incredible shiurim, not mine, but everyone else's, possible. And, um, and, and I wish you all a good Shabbos. And I hope that we've learned together something for, for, for today. Thank you very much.